card. Hmm. Hi, so my guest on this week's podcast is, um, you'll probably know him as M.W. Craven, also known as Mike. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from your author bio that I uncovered from your website. Um, so you were born in Carlisle, you grew up in Newcastle, joined the army at 16, um, left 10 years later to complete a social work degree. Uh, 17 years of taking up a probation officer role in Cumbria at the rank of assistant chief, chief officer, no less. He became a full-time author. The puppet show, the first in a two-book deal, was signed with Little Brown Imprint Constable in 2017 and released in hardback in June 2018. So it seems that I've these three years that I've been stalking you now then, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big leap from, uh, or is it really, from probation officer, assistant chief officer to a full-time author. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Um, it, it's, I, I suppose, Chris Grayling, um, the, who was the Minister for Justice at the time, uh, failing Grayling. Yeah. He, he's responsible in, in a roundabout way because he decided to half privatize probation. Mm -hmm. and, and I was, um, I'd already I had a publishing deal at that point with a small, uh, a smaller publisher, Cafe and Nights, and I had a bit of savings. And I, I could sort of see if I elected to go in the private sector, I would probably be offered redundancy at some point um, mm. and that's it that's exactly what happened and uh, I think it was in 2014 we um, separated in, into the private and public sector the public sector all became uh, civil servants yeah. and I was offered redundancy I didn't have to take it it was it was a voluntary severance I think ultimately I was managing Cumbria at the time because we merged with Lancashire the private the private part of it I was managing mm -hmm. Cumbria and a little bit of Lancashire and I thought no I'll give it a go I'll, I'll, I'll um, but at, at that point I didn't I didn't have an agent or anything I just had a very small publishing deal so it's September 2015 Right. Which was just after Burial Gown, the, the first in the Fluke series, Born in the Burial yeah. Gown was released. I, 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 I sort of took the plunge. But wow. luckily at the back end of that year, I signed with David Edley, um, who's, who's one of the big agents in London. Yeah. He sort of looked after me from that and, and guided me. So mm -hmm. it, it, it all sort of came together quite nicely in the yeah. end. But it could have went either way, I, I suppose. Well, I mean, I guess it could have done, but when you, you're a writer as good as yourself, I mean, that talent for me just leaps off the page. I think... I don't think we've seen. There's, there's always a bit of luck, though. I mean, the, the, there there is because there's some very talented writers out there who just mm. aren't getting the recognition that that, that mm. they deserve. So, that, and I, I was doing a podcast with uh, Mark Billingham. Oh yeah. Last week, and we both said, I mean, it is. There's an awful amount of luck um, mm. in in sort of just just getting the, the a the publishing deal with the one of the big five, and then getting mm. the sort of. Um, attention of all the publicists and things because they've only got so so much time they can give each author and things so you've got to make yeah. a mark fairly early otherwise you become less of a priority unfortunately yeah yeah and I, I think that's maybe a, a bit of a misconception about being a writer is that there's only maybe 20 30 percent of our time that's spent doing the actual writing as especially if you've self-published or you're independent um and the rest of it's spent doing the marketing the sales the promotion <laughs> yeah I, I i i think my time with caffeine nights held me in good stead mm. um for this because i was used to sort of taking an active role in marketing my own work yeah. I, I was never self-published so i never had to do that side of it but um I was always hands on. I would go and hunt out opportunities for, to, for mm -hmm. sales and things. And I carried that on through to um, when I was with Nat and I had a publicist and marketing people and yeah. a full sales team behind me. But I never lost, lost that sort of um, desire to sort of get out mm -hmm. and speak to readers. I didn't just want to sit back and let um, let other people take take charge. They do now and they've become more forceful and they're, and they're doing things that I don't get much choice in. Um, which is all good, but I'll still I'll still do things like this podcast and I'll yeah. do in um, a whole range of events. Uh, well, it's this week now actually because we're in a new week, aren't we? Um, just yeah. to promote the book, which I know some authors when they hit the um, the big publishing houses, they, they just sit back and think, mm. um, well, "My job's to write the book, and it's their job to sell them." Yeah, um, I, I've never really taken that view. 
yeah yeah I think I, I think it, it doesn't matter how I mean I was speaking to Peter James the other week and he still does is, is still involved with a lot of the promotion of his mm. own books and tv shows and stage shows and things and he says it's something that doesn't matter how big you get you're still gonna it's still something that you have to do and get involved with and I think that's where the connection with the reader comes as well I think if you were to stand off how would you develop that that reader writer relationship and I think it's that's so enjoyable as well I mean yeah. I, I enjoy um having a laugh with the readers yeah um I I even enjoy it when people haven't liked the books I'll still have a bit of banter with them yeah um, and it, it's absolutely fine and it's what I did I, I just remember the thrill I, I wrote um Mark Billingham an email this is before I was an author just to say how much and I forgot which book it was it was the one where it, Fallen like undercover in London, um, amongst the homeless population in London. Yeah, and I and they had its genesis in um, the Gulf War, a, a tank crew in the Gulf War, and I just I wrote an, an email just saying how much I'd enjoyed the book and how realistic um, the tank crew part had been portrayed. And mm. emailed me back, and I was absolutely thrilled with that. <laughs> and I, I I've always remembered that, and yeah. Um, so which is why I'll keep on engaging with readers because it's yeah. it's fun, but it's also important as well. Absolutely. I think I think it's nice that readers see you as a person rather than just a person beyond the words It's you know, you're an individual. And I think that, I think it's all about being relatable. I think everything that you do with marketing and, and promotion, you have to be relatable. And I think you most definitely are. Um, so tell me then, you mentioned that you you obviously have an agent. Um, how did that come about? Did you pitch to them? Did they approach you? You said there was luck involved. Um, yeah, th there was. I I, I had attended um, a crime writers conference in Gretna, right? The, the year before I met my agent, and it, it, it's a, a, a sort of weekend long workshop for work for um, four workshops, two each, two in each day, but like long two and a half hour job is with with established crime writers yeah. um, and the fourth session was was either pit, it was pitching um, a publisher one year and pitch an agent the next year now the first year I pitched to the um, chief exec of Kathy Knight why I've, right. just, I've just been shortlisted for the dagger the um, the debut dagger yeah or born in the burial gown he um, gave me a publishing deal the book was out in 2015 so it must have been 2014 I went um, the first time. In 2015, I had a copy of the book. And David was the pitch and agent agent because he, he, he travels the country looking for um, for talent, as he calls right. it. Um, and I, I gave him a copy. I said, here, just have a look at that. And I wasn't due to pitch to him because I didn't have anything I could pitch, actually, because I, I had a publishing deal anyway. But he, he sought me out at the end and he said, if you got any, when you finish the next book, send it to me first, please, if you don't mind. So I did. Um, and he signed me on the basis of Body Breaker. Although initially he wanted me to, to rewrite it. He, he didn't want me writing any more for Caffeine Nights because he wanted to sell it for, sell me to a big publisher. Mm -hmm. um, so he asked me to rewrite it as a new series. And it was just going to get too much. It was mm -hmm. just going to be too much hassle. So I said, we'll just pitch, we'll just sell that to Caffeine Nights. And which was what we would do, and which we did, and then I will write a brand new series from scratch. But, he, but and he said, but keep it in Cumbria because publishers are looking for books set outside wow. London at the minute. Yeah. Um, and and, and put, so I wrote Puppet Show it, the, because and because Puppet Show the the plot of Puppet Show was originally designed to be the third story in the fluke. Um, right. Sort of arc of it was it was going to be a three story arc. Yeah. Um. I had the the idea for it fully formed in my head, so it only took me twenty five days to get the first draft down. Wow! Um, and about another five months to get it to a place where I'd send it to David. David had me rewrite the first chapter completely. Um, I initially had eighteen pages. I had two two people telling each other a joke over right. eighteen pages, which I thought was a really cool idea. But he said, "No, just burn, just burn somebody to death on in, within like a page of <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I, the cat. <laughs> I, 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 I did that. Um, I've still got that scene somewhere. I might release it as a little. You should do as a short story. <laughs> yeah. Um, I honestly thought I thought if I tell if I start the book with the opening line of a joke, it'll be like uh, when Ron, Ronnie Corbett used to tell his joke in the two Ronnies, and then. 
I thought you're going to read until you get to the end of the joke because that's just human nature. And by then you're going to be 18 pages in and you might as well just keep on reading. Um, <laughs> but because the joke was about Native Americans collecting firewood, David ah. quite rightly said, um, and it wasn't a cultural thing, it was just, and it wasn't an offensive joke. It, he, he just said, it's not immediately clear that you're in Cumbria. I mean, that, that was the problem he had with it. It was, right, right. it was quite hard to place. He wanted it very much. This is a Cumbrian novel um, and it's a crime novel. As he said, mm. get Cumbria in the first few paragraphs, get a murder in the first page and a half, and then we'll, then just leave it as it is. And yeah. then um, he pitched it and, and uh, ultimately Little Brown, Little Brown bought it. They wanted some changes. Yeah. Um, it's funny, actually, my editor for Puppet Show, um, she wanted about two pages worth of notes, so some quite significant changes. When it came to The Botanist, which is Po5, she wanted one word changed. Um, so that just shows the way that I'm sort of developing as a writer because I'm getting all the support from very good editors. Absolutely, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Copy editors now. Um, so going from this, it, it took me about six weeks to rewrite it to her specifications and um, the puppet show. She wanted yeah. one, and it was just, um, she said it was just a bit lazy writing. And somebody, um, such, such, somebody said something and then I put, he snarled. And she goes, just take out snarl. It's just lazy writing. Just either think of something else or yeah. said, you actually don't even need to um, dialogue tag that anyway. So yeah. just, just took it out in the end. So, um, so that's where we're at. So, the, so was the puppet show the first in the Washington Post series? It was, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we've got to talk about him. I, I mean, him and Tilly, just, wow. Do you get tired of talking about him? Do you get tired of being asked about him? I don't. Um, I mean, it's my job, isn't it? So uh, I, if I do get tired of talking about him, then I probably need to stop writing about him. Yeah, yeah, true. The, I just um, have, have so many questions that I've written down. Um, yeah. But I really, I want... I want He's, he's such a fascinating character and I feel like I know him. I feel like if I were to walk into a pub in Cumbria and he was sat there, I would absolutely know who he was and we would sit down and have a pint. I don't know if Tilly would appreciate that, but I would. Mm. Um, how how have you done that? How long did it take you to develop him? How did that, the, even the name itself is intriguing. And he's got he's got a past that, we know very little about. I think in the um, the curator, I think you tell us a little bit more. Kind of as each book has gone along, you've told us a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but tell us, tell the people that are listening that are going to watch because they, they might not have read your books. Tell us about Washington Poe. Well, the, his character and his name are inextricably linked, as it happens. I, I didn't have a name for him on the, in the first draft. Uh, I had a I, I put a placeholder name which I knew wasn't going to be the, the the final name, and it was and, and Tilly was, wasn't the character that she was now either. She was much more streetwise, a bit more like Elizabeth Thunder, I suppose. Right. Um, but it, it it wasn't until I actually found the name, and I found that by accident because I was laughing at something that Donald Trump had said actually um, <laughs> during their primary season. So this is before he was president and it was something in the Washington Post and my wife said what are you laughing at and I said something in the Washington Post and she said what's the Washington Post and I thought that's my name that is that, that's just wow. um so I googled it and the, and I think I say this in the puppet show actually there is one other person called Washington Poe and he was a Georgian politician he had something to do with the secession of georgia in 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 america right. the states but he's like 300 years dead i think yeah and i thought well, that's a great name but poe's a cumbrian so you can't call somebody washington in cumbria without at least explaining why yeah. he's in washington and that all links in with his backstory with his um with what happened to his mother and his mother named in washington uh, i'm not going to say why just in case somebody hasn't but it, yeah. it, it was a sort of, it was a sort of um a statement yeah. his was it? let's just call it that um and because i had to therefore work out his backstory like like i said and his whole background became a lot darker therefore he had to become angrier because of his background mm -hmm. and his history um i had to make tilly a lot lighter and to sort of counterbalance that. So that's right. how that sort of came about. Um, and it's all because of his, I had to 
come up with a reason why it was called Washington. So yeah. that filtered through the second draft. And it was about the about two thirds of the way through the second draft. I thought I'm really enjoying writing this ex the exchanges between mm. Tilly and Poe because he's a lot more gruff and cynical and misanthropic, yeah. and she was um, much more delightfully naive and gullible and um, a, a bit of a social hand grenade. Yeah, that be yeah. in, the, in the in the first chapter. So it worked very well, and. I've got, a, I mean, and it comes back to what we were saying earlier. It, 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 there's an element of luck in all this. And that, that was just sheer luck. Mm. Once I got older, I thought, well, I'll just develop this um, and see how far I can get away with it, really. Yeah. I mean, the character of Tilly as well is so well thought through, I think, because it will be easy just to put, I don't know, words on the page and not fulfil a sense of character. But I feel with Tilly... Um, she's somebody who you'd want to hug, although she would detest that. Um, and she's again, she's somebody that you know, but it, the the little nuances, the little interaction between her and Poe, like when they go to work from his house and how she sets up the computers and the printers and this, that and the other. And you just get a, a, a full sense of character from her. Um, and I, ju I just love the interaction between them as well. I mean, is that something that you pre-planned? I know you said when you were writing it, you kind of enjoyed it, but did you sit down beforehand and think, right, this is the relationship they're going to have. They're going to be, you know, there's going to be banter between them. There's, he's going to be very, you know, because he, he, he's so defensive of her as well. Like, there's a scene in, in one of your books, I can't remember which one, because I've read them all. The, uh, I think it might be the puppet show. I, was it the puppet show or the career to weather in a bar and some she gets kind of verbally assaulted by some people and and Poe completely stands up for her and defends her and, and puts them in the place was that something that was really consciously done or was it just something that came out in the process of writing the scene uh, it, it happened organically I, I, I've, got, I've got to say I didn't I, when, when I'm and I don't always plot. Um, yeah. I'm certainly not a pantser. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't uh, say that. But and but my plots are quite thin, and I have a few scenes I want to get in, and mm. so that's a sort of a very thin blueprint. But scenes like that, I'll, I'll just they'll just happen when I'm writing. Yeah. And because you sort of know your characters, you know how each one's going to react. Mm. So you, so you'll hear writers say sometimes my characters were talking to me. Now, of course, they're not talking to you, but because you do get to know what they would think and do in certain situations. Mm. Um, and but I, I also didn't want to just have that replaying book over book over book, which is yeah. why Quinn's had more character development um, it, as each book goes along. And Poe is sort of mellowing because of his. Yeah because of his interaction to me so in the puppet show he was um liable to staggering over reactions um mm. when tilly was being threatened i think the the verse the first scene where that happens was in the office when he's just getting his badge and warrant card back mm. and somebody cut somebody calls tilly a retard and he yes he break the fingers and he slams him up against the wall and that's and that's the first bit of violence that you that you see from him and then later on in the bar when somebody tries to hit him with a bottle and he and he he, he grinds the glass into the hands um mm. so as the book goes on um a tilly doesn't need looking after uh, anywhere near as much she can she can hold her own um if not physically then certainly um verbally and, yeah. and she's a lot more robust and and poet has mellowed um, and anyway, uh, quite quite naturally, yeah. and I, I think if you just write, some authors will get, and I say get away. I don't mean that. Will do write books where there's no character development or, or minimal. Like um, mm. Ian Fleming obviously wrote James Bond. There was very little character development for James Bond. Mm. Lee Childs, Jack Reacher, very little character development or, or aging. Whereas I want my, my my characters to sort of go through a, a, a natural arc mm. as well, because it, I think. A lot of readers enjoy that sort of yeah that, that, I mean, that kind of thing. Speaking of your readers, now is it true that people have been going to a certain coffee shop in Cumbria and asking for a certain kind of coffee? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> and is it now available to buy? <laughs> it is. Yes, there was. Um, this, that this was brilliant. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I love my coffee, and so does my wife, and about three years ago maybe even a bit longer now she bought me a coffee subscription so you get a coffee of the month every like delivered um uh to the door and 
they, they sort of know me. And I'm, I'd mentioned this coffee house in Burial Gown yeah. um, in Black Summer. In Black Summer, I mean, it just came up. I'd, I'd chosen somewhere else, actually. But by the time it came to um, print, the coffee shop had, had shut. So I, oh. I thought I, I quickly changed it on the um, during the proofreading stage and changed it back to just the one further up, which was, which was the one I'd used previously. Um, and I, they sort of they picked up on that because I'm quite ri- widely read in, in Cumbria. And about a month ago, they sent me an email. No, they sent my wife an email, actually, because she's the one who, who they, they have her email address because of the coffee subscription. Right. So do you think Mike would be interested in. Um, do you think he'd be all right if we did, had a Washington Po blend of coffee? And oh my God. if so, we'll drop <laughs> off a bag this week so you can actually have a taste of it, just to make sure it's not honking. <laughs> uh, which they did, and I thought, wow, yeah, that's really cool. And they said, right, we're thinking of running a competition. It's actually running now um, with um, all sorts of um, prizes, including books and, and, and coffee. So, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's that's amazing. You can, actually, you can actually go into... Um, John Watts in in Carlisle, and they supply a few restaurants and, and things like that. So right. you, can ask, you can ask for Washington Pole coffee, and it's really really nice as well. That's, that's the, mind blowing. Um, <laughs> it, was so, it was so bizarre. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, but that just shows you again that re- that reader writer connection is so important, and that people will take that into into their daily lives and actually ask for the coffee. So obviously, I know you're from um, Carlisle, Cumbria and the setting for Washington Post Cottage. You've got a picture on your website um, where it's set, I'm looking at it now, it's set in amongst the landscape. Is that how you Is that how you came up? Was it, um, did you see kind of an abandoned shepherd's hut or was it just completely a figment of your imagination? I, I, I sort of like the idea of an isolated um, life and mm. fluke. Who was my first detective? He yeah. lived in a log cabin in the middle of a wood, um, and it was it was quite in, I, I, I quite enjoyed writing those scenes, and it it, it gave you a lot of scope to div, for, for plot lines as well, actually, mm. um, as well as just becoming a sort of. It, in fact, I say in one of the I can't remember which book it is. It might be the botanist. It might be Dead Ground. I can't remember which one. Where Tilly describes Herbert Crofter's pose fortress of solitude he makes the mistake yeah. of asking what that is then he, he i think the, the book says he was then forced to sit through a tedious film where a man wearing um a blue onesie and red underpants flute flies around the world saving people along those things because he, he he wouldn't have watched superman <laughs> um so yeah so w- when david asked me to rewrite it, i thought i'm gonna i'm gonna use that isolation but i didn't want to use the same exact situation mm-hmm. and my friend is a um a hill farmer up here right uh, he farms herdwicks and he has a, he has a lot of land so i i i got hold of him and uh, we just went out for a few pints and said oh, i just wanted to my character wanted to buy a dilapidate because there's these buildings are all over cumbria yeah yeah if you wanted to buy one and run electricity and, and how would you go out about doing it um so he talked me through what you'd have to do to make one habitable and right so it sort of came from it came from wow. there so Right. Wow. Okay. Because I um, I spend a lot of time in the Highlands of Scotland, and it's a very similar situation. There's loads mm. of um, cottages that are just left to rack and ruin, which forms the centre of a community, um, and it is very much isolated. So when I'm reading it, I can kind of picture that in my head. Um, but again, your descriptions and your wordplay um, is so it just it, it, it triggers so much imagery. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I, I absolutely love about your books is they're completely immersive. So when you're reading them, you know, you get in the, the chills when you get to the dark scenes, you get in the butterflies in the stomach, you're sensing Poe's loneliness, because I think he is lonely. Um, you know, you're sensing that. And I think that's just that's what's so great about your writing, Mike, is that you completely immerse the reader in the contents of the story. So moving on then, Thursday, big day. Um, this is the first day, first launch day, um, and this is book, so it's book four in the Poe series. Yeah. So I had two flukes, so actually three flukes, because when Little Brown published them, there was a publishing day for that. So this will be the seventh 
possibly eighth if you count the story. So this will be, let's just say the eighth, the eighth launch thing we've had. Um, this is the first time I'm actually doing anything for it. Um, right. We, I, I'm doing some online events, but they, nobody could do the Thursday. Um, so I'm doing one with my local bookshop, and that would be my normal launch event. I would normally have one at the old fire station, which is the community arts centre in Carlisle. Yeah. And we'd have about 100. It was gradually going up, actually, as sort of more people started reading. So I think it was about 100 at the last one, um, which was Black Summer because the curator was cancelled. So I'm doing online events um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, all the way through the week after. But the Thursday, I wasn't doing anything. My agent was coming up, so we we're going to go out for dinner, but he can't now. So oh. um, we're just going to go to the pub. It, it's funny, actually, because all my friends would come up um, from all over for launch day, and they would get yeah. ridiculously pissed. And I'd, be, <laughs> I'd, be working, I'd, I'd have to stay sober before the event, and then for about two hours after, well, they'd, <laughs> I, they'd dive into the pub, or back into the pub. Um, I'd be signing books and, and chatting to people. So... Um, I, I would finally get to there. I'd, I'd maybe grab a couple of pints and then we'd have to go back to the dog. So this time we're putting the dog in kennels and we're just going to go out and have a laugh and just enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, um, you do right. For the first time. Because I'm not, since um, I was out Little Brown, the first two books have been um, Goldsboro, they've been launches in Covent Garden mm, with a wow. local launch as well, I, I, either side of it. Um, Obviously, this time that's that's been cancelled as well because yeah. nobody nobody's travelling. Um, so yeah, we're going to enjoy this one. I think and I have enjoyed them all. It's just going to be different. Yeah, and how are you feeling about it? Because I've seen um, Waterstones are doing the special, aren't they, with the coloured edges? They're doing a special edition. Yeah. Um, and there's, there, I've seen a few competitions around as well. So there's the people. And how are you feeling about it? Um, well, there's always there's always a, a few nerves when you think, well, because this, this is actually my favourite book in the series so far. Oh, is it really? Means, which either means it's going to be everyone else's favourite, or it's absolutely going to bomb completely, and everyone's going to hate it. Uh, you just you just don't know, because um, I didn't. I I thought the curator was actually the weakest in the se- in the series. No way. But everyone everyone's sort of um, says it's the, it's. I mean, obviously, there's there's some dissenting voices. Some people say the puppet show's still the best. Um, but I, because I, I'd struggled with the curator, um, mainly because the plot I wanted to do, which was actually Dead Ground, actually, I wanted to write Dead right. Ground. My editor said, no, it's too much like a thriller. Um, and it was, she was right to say no. So I had to come up with something from, from, from scratch. And I really struggled. Um, start Because normally I'm, I'm thinking about the next book about mm. about a year in advance of writing it. Um, mm. Because as I'm going along, which which is why I can see things in one book, which will become apparent in the next one. Right. Um, which is which is why, like um, in Black Summer, Stephanie Flynn was um, got pregnant, and there was a yeah. thing. Was how she was grumpy about that, and that became she was carrying that pregnancy all the way through the curator, obviously. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm 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 suitably nervous. If you don't get nervous, then you probably I don't know. Um. I think you sh- you should. Yeah, nervous, but there's also a little bit, a little tinge of excitement, and yeah, and the pre the pre sales have been, um, they've been on a, on a sort of um, upward. Fantastic. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know what percentage wise, but I mean, I think year on year sales has been about four hundred percent rise, which is wow. and, and they're very happy with it. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think for, for me, the curator left me speechless. It was one of those books that by the time I'd finished it. I read it on Kindle. I just sat looking at my Kindle. I was like, I just, and I had to skip back and read certain parts of it again. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, I remember talking about the ending uh, with Mick Heron actually at Harrogate one year. Yeah. And I said, this is what I'm thinking of doing, Mick. What do you think? And he's like, oof. And when I got the edits back, I was like expecting my editor to say, no, it's too much. And they wanted a little, they wanted a little bit. There was there was two bits they wanted change, which I I did. One was a bit which, which Poe basically tortured somebody. Um, right, yeah. right. And then you'll you'll probably know the scene. He, he was desperate to get some information. He needed it very fast, and he, he basically tries to pull a broken bone out of someone's arm. Yeah. Uh, he said, "No, nah, it's too much." So he just flicks it instead, um, which which will hurt just as much. I imagine. But, uh, <laughs> Still got a squeal. That's, that's a bit more palatable for readers. Um, yeah. So, 
the, yeah, so I, I sort of enjoyed that. And I also liked, uh, I wanted readers to come away with the feeling that not every, not, not every character you like is is going to be safe. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's potential. I mean, there's the four main characters, if you include Edgar. Yeah. Uh, and maybe a, a sort of a slew of secondary characters like Joe Nightingale and Ian Gamble yeah. and um, Estelle Doyle and a few others who um, become drifting out of books as, 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 as it happens. And I... Poe's going to be safe, obviously, because it's a Poe book, and I'm not I'm not stupid enough to kill off Tilly, and you can't kill Oh, God, you, Mikey but would every, be hunting down. Everyone, everyone you can else hunt it down. <laughs> I think I'm the med up saying, say, I'm just going to have a, a Poe book with no Tilly in it, and she says, you can't, you can't. Oh, my God, no, don't. No, you'd, you'd meet your own Annie Wilkes. You'd be tied to a bed, <laughs> and you'd have your ankle smashed. God, no, I'd fear for you. Um, Okay, right, I'm going to move on. Let's lift the mood a bit. I'm going to ask you, going to throw some curveball questions in. Are you ready? Yeah. What song would get you on the dance floor? Oh, um, Baby, I Love You by the Ramones, because it's my wedding song. Oh, good choice. I like that. Um, what are your future plans as an author? How long have we got Washington Poe around for? I, 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 the next two are written, so... Um, Five and six are five, five is completely done. I, I just need to go through the proofs, but I'll have I'll probably have hard copy arcs uh, later this year. Um, six, I've got a very good first draft, um, and I'll finish that off a bit later. And I know what I'm going to do for seven. Um, well, I'll, I'll see what the next contract looks like because the year when I was in probation, actually. And before we privatised, I was getting super bored because you don't get to do anything fun when you're an assistant chief officer. It's all meetings, mm -hmm. like high-level meetings in the during the war. I started to write um, a thriller in my lunch times, just on my, my Mac, um, my MacBook Air. Yeah. And I just kept at it, and I just wrote like half an hour a day. Sometimes it would be for an hour, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit shorter. And I finished it, and I quite liked it, and it was a bit sort of Jack Reacher. It's set in the States. Uh -huh. And during the pandemic, the first year, um, my editor was, she must have had a, a gap in her reading schedule. And she emailed me, have you got anything you've written that I've not read? Because they'd bought the Fluke series by then. Mm. Uh, bought them off my previous publisher. And I said, well, I've got this rather violent, over-the-top thriller. So she said, let me read it. And she loved it and she wanted to buy it. So that, that's, that's part of the current contract two fluke books and this standalone thriller which mm -hmm. i've just got the edits back actually and i'm going to be working on them that's my next job wow. and that'll be coming out either after post six or between po five and six so at some point there's going to be a gap between between po books and um, mm. some people are going to be unhappy about having to wait two years for a po but that's just see that's the thing your books are so addictive that you you, you read as kind well, of me, I, well, I, me and it's mark, not a bad position to be in <laughs> it, it's not but mark and i on the podcast the the subject of the podcast was it was um crime series right so pros and cons of writing a crime series and mark's obviously much more experienced than because he's like 17 or so books into his Tom Thorne series. And he says, you've got to break her up with standalones just for your own sanity. Yeah. And I, 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 get, I know it's coming. That's the next thing I write it will not be post seven. It'll be a standalone. Mm. Um, because if you, if you don't, then I'll, I'll have written six post, seven post stories on the trot. Yeah. I've written th the, the last six books I wrote were post stories. Mm. Um, and it's and including I've, I've six short stories and a novella. Mm. Oh, as well during that um i had a break this year to write a short a horror story for an anthology just a short story right. um, and it can feel like you're, you're writing a sort of never-ending story mm. you write the end and then a couple of days later you're writing the beginning and the yeah end. so just for my, own, my own sanity i'm gonna have a break from poe yeah um and I'm, I'm gonna write another standalone and then i'll be i'll be back with poe because I, I I enjoy doing it. Yeah, and good. As, lo as long as my editor wants them, I'll keep on I'll keep on producing them. Myself. Brilliant, fantastic. Okay, so if people want to find out more about you, your website is nwcraven.com. Yeah, there all your books uh, detailed on there as well as any events that you're attending. You do in bloody Scotland, are you? Are you? Um, I, I I don't know if I've been asked. Oh, um, okay. I, I did the last one. I was on a panel with Peter Robinson and Mary Mary Hannah. Mm. It was um, a lot of fun. Um, 
I, I, my, it all goes through my publicist, so I, I don't get yeah. to hear about things till quite oh, late. Okay. Sometimes, um, I'm, I'm doing Bradford at the back end of this, back end of June, Bradford Lit. Yeah. At the, at the minute, that's a physical event. I'm in conversation with AA Dand, and I've got a lot of online. I'm doing some in-store signings um, around the county. Um, I haven't, I haven't actually released that yet, but I, I, I will be. Right. Okay. So keep an eye out for them as well. Yeah, it will be on the website. Fantastic. And Thursday, Dead Ground is out. So it will be available everywhere, I would imagine. Anywhere they sell books, yeah. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time, for giving up some of your bank holiday to chat to us. I thoroughly enjoyed it, um, and I appreciate your time as well. So take care, and good luck for Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.